So we're on to our next talk, talk number three, which is going to be delivered by Tobias Thiel. Uh, Tobias is a quantum enthusiast with a track record in hybrid quantum systems, combining solid state and atomic physics, magnetometry, and atomic quantum computers gained at places such as ETH, Oxford, Caltech, and GILA. He's now application scientist and technology promoter at Zurich Instruments. And Tobias is going to share with us uh, information on quantum magnetometers. So Tobias, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Hello. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, then we should probably... Do you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So then hello, everyone, also from my side. Uh, thank you for this uh, introduction. And today I'll talk about uh, current and future applications and challenges uh, for quantum magnetometers. And the coverage, of course, will not be exhaustive by any means. Uh, why is that the case? Well, as you can see, there are many different physical platforms which are used nowadays, and even more applications, as we will see later, and also have been seen uh, throughout the last talks. And um, most of these quantum magnetometers, they measure only the scalar magnetic fields, uh, strengths, for example, such as nuclei, uh, OPMs, or optically pumped hot vapor cells, which are essentially atomic gases, we've heard of them, um, envy centers and ultra cold atoms. And of course, there's others. Um, and then there's also a few that obtain a vector information by measuring a field component, for example, superconducting interference devices or squids, uh, or, or, or these OPMs in the so-called uh, spin exchange or fixation fee or surface. And one thing that they all have in common is the, sort of the sensitivity or most the sensitivity per volume is the key figure of merit. And, and this essentially tells you how much small of a field a sensor can measure within a second. And it's sort of a specific treat of these quantum magnetometers that they're typically sensitive enough that the sensitivity can be quoted comfortably in picoteslas or even femtoteslas per root hertz. Uh, and just as a comparison, we all know the Earth magnetic field is on the order of 50 microtesla. And this sensitivity now really sparks a lot of different applications. Uh, and these on every scale, actually. So only a fraction, of course, uh, I mentioned here again, and uh, we've seen some of them uh, already before. Uh, so there's uh, these applications really range from navigational and geological services uh, to biological imaging um, and all the way to dark matter searches or uh, magnetometry on nanostructures. And the important is that the market on these quantum magnetometers is still growing rapidly and forecasts uh, indicate it will be uh, much more than actually 700 million by uh, within the next few years. And since you now cannot cover all these, okay, let's maybe focus on some of the common challenges and key applications, which are driven by uh, some of the quantum magnetometers, which have turned out to be particularly, particularly promising given their recent developments. And these are uh, optically pumped magnetometers uh, and NV centers or nitrogen vacancy centers. And indeed, they're forming sort of better and better alternatives to the long dominating squids, which have been around for actually quite some time already now, and, uh, but which face sort of this major limitation, which is that they need to be cooled to cryogenic temperatures. And this can, of course, be done, um, but it is challenging in the end. It does limit the uh, effective sensitivity. Um, so if you take, for example, now OPMs, for example, um, then they have recently experienced another push in terms of commercialization, especially because now sensitivities in this surf regime are now really matching the ones from squid loops. And the NV centers, they're not as sensitive yet, but have the clear advantages in the nano-sensing domain, uh, but more to this later. So first, uh, we focus on uh, optically pumped magnetometers, and here are a few of the particular promising applications. Uh, so they can be operated both in ambient, but also at almost zero field conditions. And the advantage of these sensors, in, especially in the high field regime, they are mostly military re or research type of applications, such as human brain interfaces or, or space exploration. But because of their variability, they can also be used in field-free environments where they're interesting for extremely precise measurements. Uh, for example, we heard the uh, magnetoencephalography, uh, where one measures sort of brain activity on the Pico-Tesla level, or dark matter searches where you look for axion planets which sort of cross the Earth. But also in the RF field sensing, they have been shown to be useful uh, failure analysis and the chip characterization in the microwave regime, for example, become particularly interesting if you now want to start debugging quantum processors. 
So what now makes these OPMs so attractive? Okay, so on the one hand, they occur naturally, they can be understood essentially from fundamental principles, and they're all the same. And especially this last point really allows you to increase the sensitivity by addressing many of them in parallel. So if you take, for example, such a typical cell, uh, which you see here on the, on the right, uh, it's typically size of two millimeter cubed, there you can address 10 to the nine and up to 10 to the 11 sensors at the same time. Now, given that the sensitivity increases with the sensor number, this is really one of the big strengths of the system. And as quantum particles, atoms are naturally sensitive to anything which can disturb their quantum state. And this is, of course, a strength if you want to be sensitive, but maybe not so if you want to make a clock or, a, or, a quant or a preserve coherence for a quantum computation. Uh, furthermore, the interaction is very well understood, and this really allows you to form it to your advantage and, and use the best uh, configuration. And just to illustrate this, maybe let's have a look at, a, at an example, okay, uh, where we want to measure the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, of course, there's many other techniques, uh, even in the OPM regime, to, to extract this field information, but the relevant ingredients stay the same. So first, what you do is you generate this microscopic spin state, which you do by optically pumping the gas. And this is sort of this uh, green arrow, which we see here. Um, and of course, that's why they are called in the end optically pumped magnetometers. And the spin state then processes with the Larmor frequency around the magnetic field, which you in the end want to measure. And since the frequency then only depends on the magnetic field strength, you simply want to just measure this frequency as precisely as possible. And uh, so how do you do this? Well, one of the um, one of the key strengths also of this technique or of these sensors is that there's a, a quantum non-demolition measurement based on a Faraday rotation which, you can, uh, which essentially does not disturb the, the, the sensor itself or the dynamics of the, of the spin. And this you can essentially typically read out by, uh, by having a far detuned laser beam and the polarization essentially changes uh, with the direction of the spin state. And uh, essentially, with a simple photo detector, what you can do is you can read out this precession of the spin. So here's an example of such a photodiode trace, which we took during my time at, at Gila in, in Boulder. And uh, in the beginning, we created the spin state within a few microseconds by, by pumping. And then essentially, you can really just really monitor in real time on your photodiode how the spin state starts to, uh, uh, how the spin state uh, processes and, and starts to uh, deface. And uh, especially then you have this very regular uh, oscillation, which you now want to determine as, as precise as possible. Yeah? Okay, and the, the only challenge now is to measure this frequency uh, so precise um, with, the, and typically with the, on the order of, of millihertz uh, resolution, uh, even if you measure only for a millisecond long, okay? And there's essentially two things which limit your frequency resolution. On the one hand, you really have the spin physics of the sensor, so that's essentially how the, the, the atoms in the, in the cell interact with one each other. Um, but on the other hand, you also need the right control and readout techniques. And uh, both of them are fairly well understood, but there's still uh, a way to really uh, further develop them. And um, I'm not going now into the depth of uh, this atom-atom spin interactions, but maybe uh, given that uh, I'm now from a, from a company creates this uh, uh, control electronics, we, we maybe have a look at the challenges of uh, how you really can very precisely with millihertz resolution uh, read out or determine this frequency uh, when you only measure for a millisecond actually. And uh, this is actually uh, measurements which are done together with Sonia Knapper. And here the goal was to determine this frequency to, with a, uh, at least a resolution of 20 millihertz uh, within a, a measurement of one millisecond. And this corresponds in the end to a few tens of femto tesla sensitivity and roughly to the state of the art of, of the sensors which were available at that time. Because uh, the goal was to make a human brain interface out of that, it all needed to run in real time uh, and uh, with a high dynamic range in terms of B field sensing such that uh, if, if a pilot, for example, uh, changes its altitude, then uh, and the B field changes that, that uh, he still can control his uh, system. So the approach that, that uh, CERG Instruments at that time took with, uh, with the group of Sonia on such an experiment was to use a lock-in amplifier. After all, that's essentially one of our core technologies. And then demodulate the signal digitally and in real time and calculated the phase evolution. 
And this phase evolution evolves linearly with the difference of the reference signal, which you know very well. That's what lock-ins are, are good in. Um, and then uh, the Laumer frequency, uh, which you don't know but want to, uh, want to find out. And then essentially by just fitting the slope, which you can do very easily within a millisecond, you can then determine the B field precisely. And indeed, uh, it worked actually out uh, very nicely. We could measure these fields in real time and over a range of four micro Tesla and with a sensitivity of close to 100 femto Tesla. And these were both limited uh, in the end rather by the sensor and not by the controller electronics anymore. So indeed, uh, now summarizing sort of the learnings from, these, uh, from this uh, case study here, is uh, it's indeed a challenge for the readout electronics to keep up with the progress of the sensors towards more and more precise measurements. And although lock-ins are, of course, a great tool to read out these sensors, uh, they are, uh, because they're low noise and have stable references, there are upcoming improvements which need to be made to fully unlock this full application potentials of these sensors. And uh, these are actually not to underestimate. Uh, for example, most of the challenges will lie in developing multi-channel systems which need to be well synchronized and crosstalk free. Um, this is, for example, very uh, interesting or very important for these uh, MEG or magnetoencephalographic uh, systems or brain uh, monitoring or brain imaging systems, which we've heard several times before already. On the other hand, you also want to miniaturize and reduce the power consumption, also as Eden said, uh, to get them, for example, onto CubeSats or, or exploration drones. So size of the control electronics and the sensor, of course, and the power consumption do matter a lot as well. But maybe uh, let's turn now into, uh, to envy centers, which are also a very promising uh, new uh, magnetometry, uh, quantum magnetometer uh, direction. And uh, here their biggest and most promising application fields, at least currently lie in the, in the nano world. And of course, uh, envy centers are also reaching out into other fields where OPMs and squids are still dominating, but currently their sensitivities are not really yet at the competing level, although they're catching up very quickly. And it's, Recent startups such as QSaber have shown now it's, it's really feasible to make microscopes out of a single envy center, which is embedded into such a nanotip. And this can then be used to scan over probes to investigate new technologies, for example, skirmions or ferromagnetic wall domains, uh, to investigate, for example, new types of classical or maybe even quantum memories, which are much denser and, and more robust. And uh, to have a look also at, a, at another case study, sort of not quite 10 years ago, we saw first demonstrations, uh, for example, by Patrick Melatinsky, um, where they already imaged sort of uh, the magnetic domains of a hard drive with, uh, with a single envy center in the confocal microscope and some RF fields. And as you can see in, the, uh, in this picture, this, uh, they already then could resolve the individual bits very precisely and with a resolution of uh, three nanometer and even extract the direction of the B field. So in summary, what are the advantages of this technique? Of course, uh, other than that it's, uh, you have nanometer resolution, it, uh, they, they can, for example, um, measure at room temperature. Okay, that's, that's uh, important to, uh, compared to squids again. Uh, other information can be measured at the same time. Uh, and on the control side, and this is actually not to understand, uh, underestimate this, that one big advantage which you have is that this envy center is a single quantum object. So all the standard control techniques and algorithms and manipulations which are developed for single qubit control can really be exploited to increase the sensitivity. So for now, uh, the, the final few minutes, uh, maybe let's discuss one of the upcoming most biggest challenges in, in magnetometry applications. And this is sort of going into higher dimension. And, uh, a big problem that most of these sensitive quantum sensors uh, have uh, is that they are atom-like, okay? And uh, with, if, since they're atom-like, they are sort of naturally scalar. Um, but for many applications, you actually would like to have a, a vector, even the tensor information about the magnetic field. It's, this in the end provides you with new information and can strongly reduce the measurement time. So there's techniques to obtain one or two directions using these scalar magnetometers uh, already. However, you will always need to have sort of the full 3D information in the end. And this puts you into a certain problem. Um, and this problem is that you have to sort of mechanically reference at least two or typically three sensors with respect to each other. And you have to calibrate this uh, respective position. And this is, for example, exemplified by these two squid loops where each of them measures very precisely a single direction of a magnetic field. 
but uh, only to, to get the full 3D information, you would have to put sort of three or package three of these sensors together. And this really puts into place that you have these extremely sensitive sensors. At the end, the accuracy and maybe usefulness of your sensor is in the end limited um, of a, because you essentially map this extremely sensitive device onto an often mechanically fixtured device, which, which might be, which is very um, uh, difficult or extensive to, to maybe calibrate once, uh, but then loses calibration also at some point. So what's needed in the end is really an absolute vector magnetometer, and this doesn't really exist today with the best sensitivities, uh, and uh, it's even challenging to do this uh, an absolute magnetometer for, for scalar measurements already. But sort of just in the last two years, there's been actually quite a bit of progress towards this, also thanks to very recent and upcoming pushes by, by funding agencies like, like DARPA toward vector and tensor magnetometry. And the approach here is to reference your quantum magnetometer to a fixed but well-known reference in space. Okay, so Envy centers, for example, took the approach and referenced their system to the crystalline axis of diamond uh, in a passive way, um, essentially with the assumption that these, these directions change only minorly with ambient temperature or drifts in the in the end in the temperature uh, in the in the ambience. And this, of course, then in the end provided them with this very sensitive measurements of the different field projections of a magnetic field. So in, uh, at my time at Gila, we uh, took a different approach using OPMs, and there we used actually the microwave polarization of an arbitrary microwave field as a fundamentally and self-calibrating reference in space. Okay? And the advantage here is that you can, this can be fully derived from fundamental constants again, and uh, provides the field direction only, and this therefore sort of seamlessly integrates uh, with the most extent, most sensitive uh, scalar measurements uh, which exist today. And the nice experimental treat, of course, is also, and this goes back to the to the advantage of envy centers before, is that uh, it nicely combines the atom control with quantum technology and uh, sort of the, all the techniques which we see and have seen throughout this conference. Uh, we could actually use uh, to to uh, or we, which we could we could actually use for for making this uh, system sensitive. So, for example, in the end, uh, to measure these nice Rabi oscillations, which you see here, these are actually really single shot measurements where you again could see in, in real time the, the Rabi oscillation uh, decay on your phototide. Um, we could really use all these techniques like adiabatic passages to, uh, to, make, uh, to prepare these states and make them sensitive in these cells. And I think uh, with this, I think this is really a nice place to, to maybe end this presentation. And uh, of course, I'm looking forward to the questions. Tobias, thank you very much. Very interesting work at Zurich. I want to mention also that you and uh, Stefan Koch are going to be speaking this afternoon. Uh, you have a keynote at 110. So for all of our participants who want to learn more about the great work that Zurich Instruments is doing, uh, please stay tuned or come back at 110 to hear uh, the, the keynote address. We have a question from the audience. I'm going to sort of paraphrase, but the idea is um, this query came in saying, I'm interested in applications for neuroscience, very interested in MEG and axion search. Could you share a little more detail about uh, the work you're doing in that space? Um, yes, I mean, I, I can share a bit about uh, maybe not specifically what, what we are doing, and sometimes it's, it's a bit confidential, but of course, um, it is essentially what you, in, in especially in MEG, what you, uh, and we've heard this before, or you want to have place sensors all around uh, they had, or and then each sensor needs to be uh, very sensitively uh, controlled, and there are uh, typically there there are these uh, OPMs are in the surf regime, so at zero field are, are used for this. And, and uh, the challenges here are really that, uh, at least from the control side, is that any crosstalk can actually falsify uh, your mm -hmm. system. So if you and this starts from from the actual excitation uh, of your laser, but also then crosstalk. Uh, uh, in uh, between the sensors or, or between the different lines. Uh, and, and we also heard uh, examples of polarizations in the fiber. So these are all challenges which, which still need to be figured out there. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, uh, it's, uh, it, is, it is a very promising field and I think there's several pushes uh, around the world. And uh, the lock-ins are of course one of the key, um, the key uh, measurement instruments to get the actual signals out of that. Yeah. yeah, great. Well, thank you, Tobias. We're out of time. I also want to encourage 
uh, participants to go to the exhibit hall, to the sponsor tab, and uh, and visit with you and members of the team and learn more about the work you're doing at Zurich Instruments. So Perfect. thank you. Thank you Thanks for joining us. Thanks.